often talk about the risk of children and youth being exposed to pornography online. And the, the results were that it really isn't a risk, it's kind of a fact that the percentage of kids that are exposed to pornography is so high that we have to just know that it's out there and we have to address that. And the other uh, thing about cyber that's important is that it happens when a child is supposed to feel safe. I and mean, we know there's other situations where kids are supposed to feel safe at home with abuse. And, but cyber risks are one of those situations where the children are at a place where they're supposed to feel safe. The other thing I think it's important to stress about that, when we talk about cyber uh, abuse, we often, or cyber risks, it's often talked about as though they're separate. And I think what we know, what we're finding more and more, is that there's often a relationship. So it might start offline and go online. It might start online and go offline. So the kids who are vulnerable offline are often the kids who are vulnerable online. So it's, it's important to be aware of that, but not to just see it as something totally different. And there's also categories. There's, there's risks of contact, the content, and then behavior. So now we'll get to cyberbullying. The thing about cyberbullying, because it's fairly new, at this point I would say there's no universal definition. But generally, um, it's considered to be the use of communication and information technology that's meant to cause harm. So it's intended to cause harm, which is also one of the things that makes bullying and cyberbullying both complex because it's hard to show the intent. But the criteria are, it's some criteria intend to cause harm, that there's a target, and that there's a power imbalance. Now, in traditional bullying, the power imbalance would come from things like age, size, popularity, a number of kids. In cyber, the, technolo the technology causes a lot of the imbalance. So, for example, that you have, um, you might be more knowledgeable, or the ability to spread it so quickly. Those are the things that cause more power imbalance. The, the potential audience is huge. And in the mind of the target or the, the victimized child or youth, the, even, if, even if it isn't being spread, they believe it might be. So the fear of that is also really critical too in terms of the effect. And it can occur on any technological device. And to determine whether an incident is cyberbullying, the context must be considered. And that's the same with traditional bullying. And it makes it complex because when you go back to my, one of my earlier slides when I talked about one of the things about cyber technology is it happens all the time, it's so fast, it's so spontaneous, and if you, anybody who speaks to kids talk about how they're going back and forth and they might be saying really nasty things to each other. And so the question is, is that cyberbullying? Is that conflict? We might say it's not the best way to communicate, but if it's not the best way to communicate, but it's mutual, that's different than if it's cyberbullying. Both need to be addressed, but if it's actual bullying, there really is a power imbalance, and that's critical because without uh, an, somebody intervening, the power imbalance gets entrenched. Repetition is complex because in traditional bullying, the repetition is it keeps happening over and over. In cyberbullying, it might only happen one time, but as we know, people who see it, people who get it can can distribute it over and over again. So the repetition happens in a different way. And the other thing that's, that's important about the repetition is in traditional bullying, when the episode is over, even if it's gonna continue the next day, it's over um, for the time being, and there might be places where the child or youth know they're safe. But in terms of cyberbullying, um, it, it really never ends and they can, can never be removed. I remember speaking to police officers when we were doing some research with, uh, with them, and they said the number one request they got from kids and parents is they'd get a phone call to say something was online about their kid, can it be deleted? And, and when we ask, if you ask kids if they can delete pictures and messages, most of them, even though they're so advanced and have so much knowledge, most of them think that when you delete it, it's deleted but then when they find out that you cannot actually delete it, it's on there forever, uh, that, that's really important in terms of the effect of that is, is pretty big. So as I said, there are ways that overlaps with traditional bullying, the power differential. 
The other really important thing, and I think this applies to all forms of abuse, is that many don't tell about it. And that's, that's a really important issue. And I'll come back to that later. We found that out in our research too. The reasons kids don't talk about it and how, what we can do to, to address that. And the other way that overlaps is that they can both have significant effects on kids. And, you know, we often, by the time it gets to the news media, it's something really dramatic and tragic. And I'll talk, you know, I will talk about how it's important to, to recognize that even the episodes or the events or the incidents that seem minor, and somebody might say, oh, it's nothing, just forget about it. Those are the kinds of things that we also need to take seriously because it's what it does to the child's sense of self, their self-esteem, and what they do with that. So even though it seems minor, it doesn't mean it is minor, and it can really have significant effects. The other important overlap is they both occur in the context of social relationships, and cyberbullying is not anonymous. It happens among kids they go to school with and among friends, and they both occur in the presence of witnesses. And that's really important because one of the things we have found out with traditional bullying is one of the best ways to address it, and it takes time and energy and commitment, is to help the peer group stand up and stop it. In fact, research shows that if a peer says stop, it stops much quicker. And same as in the cyber world. But we know to stand up to somebody, if there's a group, to, for a child or even adult, but to be able to stand up and say, don't do it, is not easy. It takes confidence, it takes knowing that there's support around them. So you, we can't just ask kids to do that. We need to be able to help them uh, feel support and um, really to feel support so that they're able to do that. And they both involve repetition, although it's different repetition. Um, so some differences really are that um, here, here are some of them. Uh, the, fear is, the fears are different. The fear in um, traditional bullying is that if they tell somebody, they're gonna, the, the, the child or youth who bully them are, is going to come back and, and do it worse, and it's going to get worse. And it's important that that often does happen. I mean, I, I mentioned that later. But often, again, as adults, we often say, tell an adult. So, we've, so the problem is, and I know in, in my in research that I've done, some of the kids have said, and, and they feel like, I remember this one boy in grade four, grade five, who had really had insight. He said he knew his parents meant well. He knew that when they wanted him to go to the principal, that that would be the best thing. He said, but they don't get it, that it will get worse. So often it does get worse, and that's what they're afraid of in traditional bullying. and cyberbullying, they're worried about something else, which is that their parents, to protect them, will cut off their technology. And that's critical because cutting off the technology is cutting off their social world. It's cutting off their social life. So they were actually not do it. We, um, in one of the studies I did, we analyzed posts by Kids Help Phone. That's an agency, a phone in and a web-based uh, cross-Canada agency for kids. It's anonymous. They can talk about anything. And the kids, some of the kids talked about these really risky situations they were in where they were quite afraid that somebody was going to come after them. And they actually talked about the fact that they would prefer to wait and hope nothing happened than tell their parents because they thought that their parents would cut off their technology or that the parents would hate them for getting involved in the first place. So, so that's really critical, and I'll come back to that. So in terms of how common it is, um, as you can see, we, don't, we know it, it's somewhere between 10 and 72 percent, which all that shows is that there's no common definition that depending on how you define it, depending on how you ask about it, it, it ranges. And that happens in traditional bullying too, but not quite as much. But we do know enough to know that it does happen enough that we need to take it seriously. Uh, and, and also, as with other kinds of cyber risks, kids who bully or who are bullied online are more likely to bully or be bullied offline. So again, it's not totally separate. And the, the really important thing, too, is that young people who are at greater risk of victimization in the cyber world are also the ones that are greater, greater risk in general. So what does make it unique? There are some things. One is that we found that in traditional bullying, there's kids who bully, there's kids who get bullied, and then there's a small group of kids who are, get bullied and bully, and they're often the most vulnerable kids, and they're really at risk. They're the ones that 
uh, other their peers like them the least, adults like them the least. They're really vulnerable. They're the group that if you work with them clinically, I, can't, I remember when I worked with them at a, this agency, they were the ones that uh, if it's very easy even as a clinician or a therapist to be irritated with them, and they're the ones who need us most to, ha to be empathic because they are really at risk. In the cyber world, it looks like that might be a bit different, and I think, again, it's, we need to find more about that, but it seems to be connected to the fact that it's much easier. It's very easy if somebody bullies you or does something to you to respond back through the technology. So it looks like the group that does both is much larger. And that's really important because then we need to understand who is this group and are they less vulnerable and what does that look like? And in the study I'm doing now, the three-year study, that's one of the things that we want to look for to see whether the roles change over time. Uh, the other thing is that um, one of the kids in our study called it non-stop bullying. It can start at school, continue at home, and that we can't underestimate the effects of that. If you think about going to school and being bullied, that's bad enough. But if you think there's no place where you can go where you feel safe from being attacked, the effect on your sense of self and just your whole relationship with school and the world, what that could do is huge. And some research has shown that it therefore can affect young people above and beyond the effects of traditional bullying. And again, um, it, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to look dramatic. It might look like it's not so big. And that's one of the dangers, is that adults might just say, oh, turn off the computer, just don't respond. It's not a big deal, just ignore it. And those are the messages that don't help because if the, it also gives the child the message that it shouldn't be a big deal. And so what's wrong with them that it does feel like a big deal? So we need to really take that seriously. And then there's bias-based cyberbullying. And similar to bias-based traditional bullying, and I think this is very important because one of the things that the, before, before we were, um, before the world talked about bullying, as I mentioned before, it was considered normal, common, and character building. So one of the good things I think in the last 20 years is that now we take it seriously. Now the word bullying is something that we realize is, is important. Um, one issue with it that, um, people have identified that I, I think is important, is that everything can be thrown under the umbrella now of bullying, and we need to not do that too. So if it's racism, sexism, um, homophobia, if we just deal with it as bullying without dealing with the underlying motivation, we're, we can't address it. So what, that's one of the risks that's happened that that can get some, um, lost, and it's important to be aware of the motivations because if the motivation is something like racism, homophobia, sexism, and it's reflective of what's happening in our society, we, we need to address all of that. And, and a common question that people will say is, so why are kids like that? Why are kids so mean? And, and again, it's important to think it's not just kids. This, this happens in a context of our world. And again, I think as social workers, when we think about the person in the environment, that's critical. So some of the mental health implications. It can be devastating for children and youth. And again, when I'm talking um, about it, 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 it can be, um, as I keep saying, it doesn't have to look like it's major, but it can be. And I think everybody knows because of the media, it's growing attention. Um, and it can affect, I think what's important is it can affect many areas of a child's or a youth's life. So um, as with anything, we, we need to be aware of that, though. So because it can get hidden. A child might come with uh, problems of depression. Oops. Is there anything we can do about that? Let me see. Okay. A child might come feeling depressed or anxious or not wanting to go to school or stomach aches or more serious kinds of issues. And often, uh, bullying might have been part of the, um, the factors that contributed to this, but it can get lost. It can be invisible. One child said, it's like a thousand paper cuts eating away at your soul. And I thought that was really significant because paper cuts are so small, and yet a thousand of them. And so 
the, there's well-documented outcomes, psychological distress, poor social adjustment, physical health, academic difficulties. It's not uncommon to... Oops. So just some of the differences, but both kids who are targets and kids who um, are involved as the aggressors are at risk. And th there's research again with cyberbullying, because it's newer, we don't know, but with traditional bullying, kids who are involved in traditional bullying are more likely to go on and be aggressive with um, in dating situations, romantic situations, and in work situations. So it's, it's uh, again, it all confirms that it's not just a, a childhood, kids will be kids. Um, so I called this the trauma of bullying. And I think it's important that, of course, not all bullying or cyberbullying episodes are gonna be traumatic for kids, but they can be. And I just wanna talk a little bit about how they can be, and it, it's important. And in order to determine the effect or anything about that, it's, it's always really important to, to listen to the child or youth and see how they're affected, but not to assume. So not to assume they are gonna be traumatized, but not to assume they're not gonna be because it's very easy to miss that. And if we miss that in a child, the implications can be huge. So the external can be the child's being stigmatized through being labeled as different, or they're socially excluded by a group of kids or one person. And it can make them feel very invisible, unwanted, and, and often they can feel to blame, and they can feel it's warranted. I, one of the kids in, um, in our study talked about having come from a school where she was physically bullied, and then she came to this new school, and she said she wasn't bullied, and she said she was pleasant, she was relieved, because she said, I just thought I was the kid to be bullied. She just expected it. So I think that uh, that external message is very important. Internally, it can change somebody's sense of self. Be they can blame themselves, they can doubt themselves, they can distrust others, and they also can want to become invisible. And Many kids um, who might love school, love going to school, all of a sudden might not want to go or want to avoid kids out of the fear and the mistrust. And then it can lead to resignation, despair. And um, again, when it gets you know, extreme things like suicide, I think anybody who, who understands these kinds of um, issues understands that it's multi-determined, so there's not one factor. Cyberbullying can't cause somebody um, in a kind of linear way to kill themselves, but it can be one of the factors among others that really make life very hard for this person, so we really need to take that seriously. 
And then we need to understand the cyclical process. So the internal victimization, feeling you're no good, doubting yourself, all of those things su supports the constructed image of seeing yourself as a victim, and then um, makes that person even more vulnerable to the external victimization, being bullied, and less likely to be able to do something about it. And that's, again, where adults need to really come in and help, help um, really interfere with that horrible process, because that can be very destructive. The other thing is sometimes, I think we live in a world where something's over, we often, like the word closure happens in two seconds, so we often will say, it's over, get over it, forget about it. And again, with bullying, that's one of those things, if the, you know, the child might have an episode or a few, it ends, and they're able to move on and be fine. And if that's the case, that's great, and that is often the case, but it might not be the case. Um, they might, it might continue afterwards. And it's really important not to discount that, not to just say, oh, move on. Because if we just say, get over it, it's not such a big deal, and the child or the youth is not feeling that, we know the effects on that. Then they feel, not only do they feel bad about this, now they feel bad for feeling bad and also feel un misunderstood. Feeling believed allows children and youth to reflect on what they need and also to understand uh, that something happened to them that shouldn't have happened and that they have the right for that not to happen. So again, I think of a, um, one of the kids in our study, we um, st started off, we asked them their definition of bullying and then we gave a definition. And our definition included being um, the relational kinds of bullying. So this one girl said, oh, I didn't think I was bullied, but now I realize I was bullied. And she talked about a group of kids just saying, go away, we don't want you around. And she said that they, they, they would then say they were joking, but she could, so until she read that definition, until she talked to us, she just accepted it. And then she realized that she thought back on the tone and that even though they said they were joking, that it felt very hurtful and she was very hurt. And, and actually talked about some of the, the effects of it, which were pretty dramatic. So the, the being believed is absolutely critical. And not validating um, is, uh, and not validating a child can have very serious effects, and it can have as serious effects of the, the original bullying, because it makes them doubt their feelings and views, and they make them feel that they might deserve to be bullied. And also, very importantly, they may stop telling adults about it. And one of the things I, I think I'll talk about later, but I think we can never say it enough, I, I've said before, often we say, just go tell an adult. And the problem with that is if you go tell an adult and it's an adult that's helpful, that's great. But we need to say, go tell an adult, and if that adult's not helpful or doesn't believe you, go to another adult, because we have to give them the message. Uh, they might not be believed, because if we just say, go, go tell an adult and it'll be good, and then if it's not, what do they do with that? So, um, because what we don't want them to do is go back inside themselves and feel that they can't tell anybody. And, and we know that that can build up. So those are the kinds of things. So when we talk, when we try to understand the effects of bullying and whether it's traumatic or not, it's not just the episode itself. It's what it means to the child and then how it's, a, how it's addressed, how it's dealt with. And similarly, if let's say it's not a big deal to a child and we make it a huge deal, that's also not helpful. So it's really important to listen. And I'm just gonna say one thing, and often with adults, um, with things like, and I know a lot of people have talked about this, with things like uh, physical bullying, it's very easy. Somebody gets beat up, it, there's a fact. With cyberbullying or with uh, relational or indirect bullying, there's no obvious fact. It's not as simple. So adults often try to figure out their own objective facts rather than listening to the subjective experience of the kids. And that's absolutely critical that we not do that because we know the facts are important, but, but really what's ultimately important is the meaning it has for the kids. And, and we need to remember that. Shame and humiliation um, is just starting to come into the bullying literature, and I think it's important because shame and humiliation, any clinician knows that it has huge, huge effects. And there's not a lot of research on it, although Wendy Craig in uh, Canada is starting to do some on it, which I think is great. Because humiliation, the sense of humiliation, is really what's often associated with devastating consequences. It's one of the critical factors that precipitate things like feeling like 
that there's no, that the horrible despair and that there's no option. And uh, what's really important to remember is that the nature of the cyber world can obviously intensify this. So if you have, we know that bullying happens with witnesses, but if the witnesses are, you know, one or two kids or a classroom or a school, we know that's huge. Those, th that number of witnesses in its, of itself can be devastating and incredibly humiliating. So when you think of the wide, World Wide Web, uh, that just, it's almost unfathomable what that can do to somebody. And again, as I said before, when we think about repetition and we think about the potential shame and humiliation, it's the idea that it's out there. So even if others aren't seeing it, it's not knowing who's seeing it and, and just how awful that can be. Um, one of the things that's happened to um, girls, uh, there's, um, there's more clinical programs that work with boys and girls who've uh, been sexually assaulted online. And they, those kids have different kinds of responses. Some of them respond by, even when they see it, even when they see themselves, they'll say, no, that's not me, because they just can't cope with the idea that that is them. But others can't turn on a computer or a cell phone or an iPad or anything without searching on the web for images of themselves. So, so some of the clinical work is helping them deal with that because they are just, the, the shame and humiliation just with them always, every time they turn that on, they go looking for that. Um, and so again, we need to think about the relational context of trauma that, that something that, uh, just what I've said, I'm just sort of repeating myself, that it can look like it's small and minor. Um, so the actual pain itself doesn't have to be the source of the tr sense of trauma for the child or an adult, but in this case, we're talking about children. It's a lack of adequate attunement and responsiveness to their reactions that can cause something that was painful and problematic to become traumatic. And I can't emphasize that enough because I feel that, and we see that it's often seemingly minor things, or, or an adult might see, you know, online somebody said something to them and said, oh, it's just words, you know, don't let words hurt you. And we need to stop and think before we do that because if those words have hurt the child and they're feeling pretty bad about it and that's a message, that can actually be thing, become the thing that makes it feel traumatic for them. And um, in general, symptoms of trauma and their severity are often linked to repetition over time regardless of uh, the external... Um, injury, and that again applies to bullying and definitely to cyberbullying. So, the kinds of things to consider when we think about is it traumatic, is the, how often, the nature of it, the severity, the type of bullying, and also whether the child's aware of the victimization. So, one thing that can be problematic is a child might say, oh no, it doesn't bother me. And those are the kinds of kids that I remember at, at the agency I worked with, a lot of them would say that. It doesn't bother me, no, no big deal, I'm getting used to it. So it's important not just to take that as, at face value, but to explore and understand what that's about because it might not bother the person because it's become part of their sense of self. That they, it's, no, it's just something they've come to expect and feel about themselves and they feel so badly. I know at this agency, we used to run the groups that we ran, we sometimes used to joke in this sort of black humor way that the kids would come into the agency, into the group feeling like, oh, great self-esteem, they feel good about themselves. And then as they talked and they would come to start to understand some of the painful things they were dealing with and felt safe enough to feel it, they'd actually feel, quote, feel worse about themselves. And um, one of the boys in the study he talked to me, it was really interesting, he, he, he came to group, he had been bullied to death, um, and he felt, he was totally isolated, had no, not just no friends, he just did not feel connected to people, and he told me that one of the things that he didn't like about the group, he said he had enough pain already, and before the group he didn't have to worry about other people's pain, but in this group there were two boys in particular who when they talked about what they went through with being bullied, he really felt bad for them. And with one of them, he had a whole fantasy. He wouldn't have done this, but a whole fantasy of how he could go stand up for this kid. But it made him feel bad. And what he said to me is, see, that's a bad thing. And he, I felt like he was really on his way to developing, ident identifying with others, feeling like he was part of a group, and feeling empathic. And with that came feeling pain. 
Um, so even though at that point he might have felt worse, in fact, it was a lot better. So, so that, that's again, when we talk about cyberbullying, it's important to remember the, that it's complex.